just say some introductory things. This is uh, uh, the briefing for AP-427 spacecraft preliminary design. Uh, there's only one team, so we'll be using the, the whole time. We've got a distinguished uh, panel of, of six uh, up here in the, in the front. I'll let each of them, when we get to the Q&A session, uh, a brief introduction of who you are so that the, the people know, in particular, so my team knows who you, who you all are. Dr. Yale, uh, I'm not used to using a microphone and I'm pretty sick, so before we start, I'm going to let everyone file in, but just to give you a heads up. Okay, let's get started. My name is Delbert Khan, I'm the project manager for Project Arms, the automated reusable modular system, and this is our preliminary design review. So to begin with, here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about. To start with, we have our mission overview, and then we go into our systems overview. From there, we're going to have our five sub-teams present. Starting with power, then going into communications, guidance, navigation, and controls, then on the physical docking system, and then our structures and propel transfer system. Then to wrap things up, we're going to have our conclusion and our recommendations. So for a mission overview given by myself and my assistant project manager, Alexander Collins. Now on to Alex. Thank you, Doug. So when we originally conceived of this project, our idea was to have a way to increase the number of payloads that could be deployed to geostationary orbit. Presently, this number is regulated by the International Telecommunications Union based on physical space and communications needs. By providing an automated, low-cost way for a mother bus to provide power, communications, and station keeping for several smaller payloads, we hope to not only increase the number of payloads that can be deployed there, but reduce their cost thus giving more opportunities for smaller groups such as educational facilities to deploy payloads to geostationary orbit. We originally considered three methods for doing this. A guidance arm docking system similar to the Canada arm system on the International Space Station, a retractable rigid boom, and a probe and rope system which would rely on the payload's own attitude and positioning hardware to make the docking. We had decided on the probe and rope as this was the simplest method to construct. To descope this design, we will be building a ground-based test system for a simulated docking system. We will have a mobile payload mounted on a platform with rollers and guided by ducted fans to simulate a space-like environment with reactionary control and omnidirectional movement. We will be able to move two axis translationally and one axis rotationally. The software tested will be similar to, a space, to what would be found in a space-based system with the main distinction of being operational in two dimensions instead of three, whereas the hardware we are testing will be unique to a ground-based system. Now to present our objectives, I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Delmar Khan. Thank you, Alex. So for our main objectives that we have, we have power to the payload, data exchange, payload exchange, and then propellant transfer as a secondary objective. These are the things we want to be able to transfer between the docking systems. And then we want to be able to accept new payloads, which is why we have our lock for the scheduled mission duration and accepting new payloads. Then we have automation, which is the guidance and navigation control system of our subsystem. And then we want to meet all of the course requirements, of course, for AE-427, and then moving forward for AE-445. So for a systems overview, it's going to be presented by myself once again, and Alexander Collins, my assistant project manager. So for our system requirements, as I just said, these are derived from our objective. We want to be able to transfer power, data, and power. <coughs> then moving on, we want to be able to exchange different payloads to accept new ones and then lock together for the mission duration. Finally, we want to have automation of our docking system. And then, of course, once again, we want to be able to deliver our concept by December 9th and for a cost of under $1,400, US dollars, which is part of the requirements of AE-427 and AE-445. Now back to Alex to talk about our system operations. Thank you, Dick. So as you can see in this diagram, in the beginning, the payload will be placed two meters from the bus on the testing table. It will begin wireless communication to determine its position relative to the bus. At this point, the ducted fans will engage and they will move the payload until it is physically connected with the bus. At this point, the locking pins shown there and there will engage and firmly connect the payload to the bus and also make the connection for our propellant transfer, data transfer, and power transfer systems. Once they are locked together, transfer of those can begin what can begin in a wired fashion. This is the overall design of our system. As shown before, we have our mobile simulated payload there with deducted fans and rollers, not shown, but under this platform. 
Here we have a fixed bus on the edge of the testing table. This is what our payload will navigate towards. Seen there is a container for storing our simulated propellant, i.e. water, and this is a simulated pressurized tank as would be found on an actual spacecraft. To transfer power, data, and propellant, we selected pneumatic pressure fittings for propellant transfer, a battery-style contact connector similar to what would be found in a cell phone for our data transfer, and banana plugs as found in many of the labs on campus for our power transfer. The locations of all these systems are shown here on the right. In order to exchange payloads, as seen here, we have our probe side, the male side, and our drogue side, the female side, mounted on the bus. As shown on the sides, we have our two locking pins that will engage and provide the downward force necessary to make those propellant connections, as well as hold the payload and bus firmly together. Not shown on this diagram are the aforementioned power and data transfer connections, which have been shown previously. Now to explain how our system will be automated, I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Gilbert Kahn. Thank you, Alex. So for our automated docking sequence, we have two different requirements that we're working with. From 200 meters, we want to build a computer simulation system that's able to guide our navigate, our navigate our bus side to our payload within 200 meters. Then once we've actually completed this, we're going to be going into a ground-based system that we're able to test from a distance of two meters, as Alex was showing in the concept in our DSCO. That system is going to be using ducted fans, and it's going to be operating off of a simulating control model that's going to be designed by our guidance navigation and control team. Finally, we've got the delivery of the entire system on December 9th. Thus far, we've met all of our deadlines. We have no reason to believe that we won't be able to meet that deadline. And finally, we have our cost budget. Currently, I'm just going to break it down by the sub-team. We have our communication sub-team with a total of $105. Our structure sub-team with a total of $230. Our controls, which consist of our guidance and navigation and control, and our physical docking sub-team for a total of $435. And then our power team for a total of $50, with a grand total of $820. Although this cost estimate may be changing, as we've just learned that our thruster system, which we're estimating is $125, is going to be able to be scrapped from another project and won't be a cost to us. And then in addition, this does not include what our ground-based system is going to be uh, costing, so we estimate another $100 or so for that. So we're assuming we're going to be well within our budget of $1,400 at a total cost of around $1,000. Now I'm going to be passing it over to Tyler Scholes, our power team. Thank you, Delbert. I'm Tyler Scholes, the team lead for the power subsystem. And this is my teammate, Mohamed al -Zaiba. We're going to be talking to you a little bit more about the power subsystem. An overview, we're going to be first talking about an introduction, hitting the power requirements, the governing equations, a little bit of analysis that we conducted for our power subsystem, the integration with the other subsystems, the subsystem summary, and then wrap it up with issues and recommendations for the future. As an introduction, we are responsible to transfer power between the pilot and the bus by using wire to ensure the safe uh, transfer of the power through both uh, bus and uh, pilot. Also, power system to be uh, physically connected. Also, the battery to ensure uh, operation of the pilot until uh, the thing with the bus and uh, of the bus. Also, we are responsible for uh, detecting short circuit and uh, circuit link by using uh, current uh, sensor to apply short circuit and since when the circuit has a uh, link. In our uh, threshold requirement is to transfer 31 uh, to the pilot from the bus. Also our objective uh, to transfer 61 uh, from, to the pilot from the bus. Uh, detecting sharp circuit until 150 percent. Uh, detecting when the uh, docking uh, circuit uh, happening uh, and uh, autonomous operation until docking. We have two equipment. Uh, one of them uh, on mode and the other one uh, power uh, equation. Now they will talk about the uh, power design. Thank you, Mohammed. So as you can see. The overarching idea is that it's going to be a wire transfer system. Considering this, we wanted to utilize something available on campus, so we chose the banana clips. Looking towards a wire type, 
we, tore, we chose the American Wire Gauge 14 Gauge Copper Wire, which is an automotive form of wire. This is replacing our former, former uh, selection, which was the photovoltaic aluminum and copper wires, which are both way too uh, expensive and out of our budget range. Looking towards the current sensor option, chose the Allegro Hall Effect Base Current Sensor, as well as the Tenergy 5000 milliamp hour battery for powering the payload before dock with that uh, with the bus. So starting with the analysis of the banana clip power transfer test, we wanted to look at a system that was capable of measuring the amount of power transferred through this banana clips, and uh, we utilized the resistor for this. So we connected one side to the positive port of the power supply, one to the negative, with the resistor in between. We measured the voltage across that, used Ohm's laws to determine that we had a total tra power transfer of 70.8 watts, which meets our threshold and objective requirements. Looking towards our current sensor option, we chose the Allegro Hall Effect based current sensor, which is a capable of transferring 50 amperes. This system is hardwired and is capable of being precise within a 5% factory error. This system has eight pins for use with multiple wires, which means that you can analyze the current through multiple wires simultaneously. We only need two for redundancy purposes, but we, uh, considering the price, you can't really go wrong. Also note that this system has a fault feature, which is utilizing that fault pin. This is capable of switching the power off in the case of a short circuit. So we program in the fault value. When that fault value is reached, it communicates with the microcontroller and suspends power transfer until further analysis of the system. Looking towards the wire type that we chose, the system was to be used as an op uh, we wanted to use the optimized value, which was 5.9 amps uh, of maximum current transfer safely. This system, with our 12 volt system, is capable of transferring a total of 70.8 watts, once again, meeting our objective and threshold requirements. Lastly, with our battery choice, we wanted to utilize a battery that was capable of sustaining power on board the payload. So essentially, in an independent power system, the battery that we chose for our subsystem at this point is a 7.2 volt RC battery, which is capable of transferring 36 watts over the course of an hour, which would be capable of sustaining that power until reaching that docking position with the bus. Look at, uh, as you can see from this diagram, the power subsystem is capable of powering every single other subsystem and is contained within the structure subsystem. Once docked, you can see that the payload is no longer responsible for powering itself independently, but has instead relied on the bus. Looking towards our subsystem summary, we've met all of our requirements besides the ability to detect when that circuit has linked. We plan for the future to figure out how exactly to utilize that current sensor to be able to detect that circuit completion. Additionally, we want to make sure that we have a solid design plan which is going to be utilizing simple switches and stepping up and down in values of voltage so that we're powering our systems properly. Additionally, future incorporation of stabilizing fans must be taken into account, which means that we need to increase the battery capacity, most likely on board the payload, to sustain that, that operation. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Brady Joel with the communication subsystem. Thank you, Tyler. My name is Brady Gold. I'm the Stephen Higgins, and we'll be presenting the communication subsystem. We'll be starting with an introduction to the communication subsystem, followed by our communications requirements, governing equations, the design of the communication subsystem, our integration and internal architecture, the current requirement status, and any issues and recommendations with the communication subsystem. So the two primary purposes of the communication subsystem but you detect when the payload is within 200 meters of the bus, which will allow us to automatically initiate communications and the docking sequence, and to transfer data between the payload and the bus throughout all stages of the mission life. This includes wireless data transfer prior to docking, which will assist with the docking operations, and a wire data transfer once the system is docked, which will allow us to support an operational payload. Explicitly stated, our requirements are as follows. Our threshold requirements are to detect when the payload is within 200 meters of the bus, and to automatically initiate communication with the payload within 200 meters of the bus. <coughs> Our data transfer requirements are summarized in the following table. Prior to docking, up to a maximum range of 200 meters, we'll be, shall be able to transfer a minimum of 20 megabits per second 
between the payload and the bus. Once the system is docked, we shall be able to transfer a minimum of 40 megabits per second between the payload and the bus, with an objective requirement of 800 megabits per second of data transfer between the payload and the bus. Our system will be using a transponder, so we have included the following transponder equation for calculating distance using the time measurement, which is returned by the transponder. Uh, we calculate the distance d by using the speed of light and multiplying it by the round trip time t, offset by a calibration constant b, which will allow us to uh, tune the system to compensate for any circuitry delay in the system. Uh, and we divide this by two so that we get the distance just from the payload to the bus and not the total round trip distance. To meet our requirements, we've, just, uh, we've broken up the communication subsystem into the following three major components. A remote ranging sensor, a long range data transmission system for wireless communication, and a short range data transmission system for wire communication. For a remote ranging sensor, we've chosen to build up a transponder system because it is omnidirectional and will allow us to measure the absolute value of the range between the payload and the bus. Uh, the system is also testable on campus, and it provides positive target identification. Unlike a conventional radar system, uh, this system is much less uh, susceptible to false readings because both halves of the system are active. Uh, and this should allow us to determine when the payload is within 200 meters of the bus. Uh, to verify that our system will work, we have to measure the or we analyze the distance resolution, which is the smallest measurable distance uh, of our sensor. Uh, this was done by using our previously shown transponder equation and substituting in for our time the smallest measurable value of the GNC's microcontroller. Uh, using this, we've calculated our range resolution to be 0.15 meters, meaning that all values returned by the sensor will be multiples of 0.15 meters, and this will allow us to determine when the payload is within 200 meters of the bus, as it is less than our 200 meter requirement. With this information, we shall be able to automatically initiate communications uh, using a digital logic circuit, but we have not done this yet, so we cannot confirm that we have been able to do this, uh, but we have no reason to believe that this will not be possible. For our long-range data transmission system, we've chosen to go with a high-speed multimedia radio unit. Uh, this provides omnidirectional radiation pattern, uh, so we do not need to point one system at the other to be able to provide communications. This is also testable on campus. Uh, it is an inexpensive design utilizing consumer available Wi-Fi equipment. And it integrates easily with our other systems because it uses a uh, simple Ethernet connection. And how this works is it creates a wireless bridge between the payload and the bus, uh, allowing a unified network in which we can place data <coughs> from one half of the system and retrieve from the other half, allowing us to transfer data between the payload and the bus. Uh, this shall allow us to meet our data transfer requirement for wireless communication. Uh, to verify that uh, a similar system would be able to meet this requirement, we analyzed the scene model 195PG wireless modem. Uh, it has a maximum communication range of 16,000 meters at a data rate of 54 megabits per second. Uh, if we use a similar system to this for our system, we shall be able to meet the data uh, transfer requirements of up to 200 meters range and a 20 megabit per second data transfer rate. I would now like to hand it off to the short range data transmission system. Thank you, Braden. Once the payload has physically docked at the bus, both the remote ranging sensor and the long range data transmission system will be deactivated. Well, then the, the short range data transmission system will then be responsible for all communications between the payload and the bus. Our solution to this type of design challenge has been gigabit ethernet. Gigabit Ethernet is capable of providing up to 1,000 megabits per second of data transfer, which exceeds the threshold and objective requirements. It's inexpensive to implement, and it only has four data pins, which makes it easy to integrate into the physical docking system. In order to verify that Gigabit Ethernet is in fact a viable solution for short-range data transmission, the following analysis was conducted. Um, using socket programming and the Python programming language, a client and a server were installed on two separate computers, and data was transferred between the two using a Category 5 enhanced cable and the Gigabit Ethernet protocol. As you can see, resulting from the test, consistently 10 out of 10 times the threshold requirement of 40 megabits per second was exceeded, and outlying results show that the objective requirement can be exceeded. With further optimization of the, of the Python code, this objective requirement will be met as consistently as the threshold requirement. Looking at how the communication subsystem actually integrates with the other subsystems, 
you can, um, as you can see, radio frequencies, transponder, and the high-speed multimedia radio are both considered active systems in that they actively engage the other subsystems within the docking system. Data coming in from the bus or from the payload will be routed through a central data processing unit which will handle the encoding, the decoding, and the modulation of the signal before handling it out to the guidance, navigation, and control for use as a redundant system in their, when they're navigating towards the bus. Gigabit Ethernet, on the other hand, is considered an inactive system because it doesn't actively engage any of the other subsystems. Once the, two payload, once the payload and the bus are docked, Gigabit Ethernet will only use the docking system as a conduit to transfer data from systems on board the payload to systems on board the bus. It's important to note that an identical system will be present on both the payload and the bus in terms of the communications components. So there'll be two radio frequency transponders and two high speed multimeter radios. Looking at our communications verification summary, as you can see, all the requirements have been met except for automatically initiating communications between the payload and the bus. As Brady mentioned earlier, this will be completed by the design of the digital logic circuit that will take the um, yeah, digital logic circuit. Moving forward with these designs, further testing will need to be completed on the long range data transmission system. We have shown that it's possible to meet the requirements, but we have not actually designed and tested the system. So once the system is designed, we'll need to complete both range testing and bit rate testing to ensure that our design meets the requirements of the communication subsystem. Additionally, further optimization of the Python code will be pursued to ensure that the objective requirement is met as consistently as the threshold requirement. And finally, in order to automatically initiate communications between the payload and the bus, digital logic circuit will be designed to meet those requirements. I'll now hand it off to Colin Hudson for you to enhance navigation and control. Thank you, Ethan. I am Colin Hudson, team lead for the Guidance, Navigation, and Control Subsystem. My team members are Chase Carlson and Jonathan Travis. Today, I'll go over what the GNC subsystem is, our requirements, and our governing equations. Then, we'll talk about the trade studies of our components, and then the design analyses of said components. We'll finish off with the requirement status and any issues and recommendations that we have. The guidance, navigation, and control subsystem will turn on when the payload and the bus are 200 meters apart. And our objective is to move the payload via the propulsion system or ductic fans to the bus so that physical docking may occur. Once that occurs, we will shut off through a, sim a signal from the physical docking system, subsystem. Our requirements, we shall begin when the distance is 200 meters. We shall show that the, show that the docking sequence can be completed when the distance is one meter apart. Our objective is for that distance to be two meters. We have an accuracy requirement that we shall be uh, no more than 1.5 centimeters translational error and no more than seven degrees angle error. Finally, our final velocity when right before physical docking occurs is, shall be 2.5 centimeters per second. And now off to Chase to talk about the governing equations. Thank you, Colin. Our first governing equation is the law of cosines, which we use to determine the angle that our payload is from the bus using the input sensor. The second uh, governing equation is the pinhole projection, which we use to determine distance the payload is from the bus using the image. Now onto our overall design. Uh, all these arrows represent uh, data transfer. First, the two sensors, the camera and the IMU, input data into the microcontroller, which is the big old bone plot. Then the microcontroller creates a navigation solution, and this navigation solution is output to the propulsion system. In our case, the propulsion system is our ducted fans. Our first trade study we conducted is of our uh, marine zoom navigation sensor. We decided to go with an image sensor, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor, or CMOS camera, physically the camera that's in your uh, cell phone. Uh, we chose it because it's accurate, it's uh, very available, it's very small and light, and it's cheap. 
Now on to our navigation software trade study. We decided to go with MATLAB because every team member is uh, familiar with it. Also it ports to C, which is what the BeagleBone Black uses. Our final trade study was of the microcontroller. We decided to go with the BeagleBone Black because it's, it has uh, sufficient processing power and RAM. It has the highest number of I.O. pins of anyone we tested. And also it, it's low cost, is only $55. Now back to Colin for the design analysis. Thank you, Chase. Our first design analysis will be on the microcontroller. We'll look at its ability to uh, process the images from the camera. And then we'll look at the number of pinouts available and required on the uh, microcontroller. Then for the navigation sensors, we'll look at the iMuse accuracy. Finally, we'll look at the navigation software ability to process those image from the, images from the camera. The microcontroller uh, is difficult to estimate its uh, ability to process the images as in its frames per second because of unknown variables as of yet. We do not know the complexity of the algorithm that will be used, nor do we know if uh, the number of processes that will be going on simultaneously with that image processing such as um, other, other subsystems connecting to the BeagleBone. Uh, looking at other projects that use the BeagleBone Black as an image processor, a uh, cited estimation is 10 to 15 frames per second. The number of connections from each of the subsystems was added and we have six I squared C connections as seen from this table. I squared C is a simple data connection where one wire is data and another wire is a clock. There are six and there is one dedicated I squared C pinout and that one pinout can connect to multiple different components because each component can have its own address. For the USB connections, there are two that are required, one for the IMU, the initial measurement unit, and one for the camera. The BeagleBone Black only has one USB port, and that issue will be discussed later in this presentation. At, on the IMU, we decided to use a VectorNav VN200, courtesy of Embry-Riddle's own Dr. Bruder. This IMU is $2,000 and its specifications are greater than any uh, IMU that we could afford, which is why we have chosen to use it. From our requirements, the velocity error should be about less than a tenth of our goal of 2.5 centimeters per second final velocity, so the velocity error should be less than 0.25 centimeters per second. The position error shall be less than 1.5 centimeters, and the attitude error shall be less than seven degrees. For the simulation, we simulated the IMU in the X and Y translational axis and a rotational Z axis given by the test platform. The, an input of a sinusoid was used. By these graphs, we can see that the velocity error over a time period of 0.2 seconds is equal to our threshold velocity error. For the position error, the error is less than our threshold over even a full second. For the attitude in the z direction, the error over even 60 seconds was still below our threshold. Summing up, we need a update of the position velocity and attitude from the camera every 0.2 seconds, or one over 0.2 seconds, five hertz. The sensors combined together actually complement each other. Together they can be more accurate than either can be alone. So these numbers will actually be improved once they have been implemented in uh, physical components. And now off to Jonathan to talk about the navigation software trade uh, design analysis. Thank you, Colin. 
In order to maneuver the payload towards the bus, we need to know two things. We need to know how far the payload is away from the bus, as well as the angle off from the dock, the docking port. In order to do that, I use the target, uh, and based on the size and the shape of the target, I was able to determine the range and the angle. And this is the target I use. I just use the black circle for the testing. In order to determine distance, I use the formula for panel projection, which is just ratio of the focal length to the size on the image sensor is equal to the ratio of the distance between the camera sensor, uh, the image sensor and the width of the target. So in MATLAB, I would use MATLAB to find a circle and it would find the target and put a red circle around it. And with this information, it gave me the center coordinates of the circle as well as the radius of the circle. With that information, I was able to determine the accuracy. As you can see, at 100 millimeters, we have a percent error of 10% which translates to one centimeter, which is within our requirement status. But if you look at the 1,000 range millimeter, we have a percent error from the max of 3.43, which is 3.4 centimeters, which is outside our requirement. So the next design was to determine angle. In order to determine angle, MATLAB would only find two circles. It would take the edge of each of the ellipse and form two circles. So from these two circles, I had to find, uh, we had to find the height of the image as well as the width of the overlap to determine angle. So using this relationship, to find the overlap of the circles, we take the distance between the two center points and the radiuses, and subtracting the distance between the two center points from the radius, we were able to determine the width of the overlap. And then with the width of the overlap and the distance, I was able to use a lot of cosine to determine this angle, and from that angle, I was able to determine the height, and then from that value, I was able to determine the height of the value and use those two values to compare to determine angle. So as you can see in this table here, at zero degrees, we have 0% zero error, but that's because at zero degrees, MATLAB only finds one circle, so it automatically sets us at zero degrees. At 10 degrees, we get a large percent error is 135, which is unacceptable for this project. But at higher levels, we get better accuracy. And I will pass it off to Colin for the requirement sets. Thank you, Jonathan. We met our requirement for the subsystem to initiate at 200 meters because we'll get a signal from the communication subsystem. We have also met the requirement to, uh, for our range and angle calculation at a, um, when the payload and the bus are one meter apart. However, we did not meet our objective requirement for that range to be two meters. We also did not meet our translational and angular requirements when that distance is shorter than one meter. For issues and recommendations, as mentioned before, the PicoBone Black only has one USB port. We can connect to both the IMU and the camera through a USB splitter. For the angle accuracy, we will be using this new target rather than just the black circle, and this new target will provide better accuracy also when combined with improvements to the MATLAB code. Also, we need to show that our code works through the full 200 meters range after our, our subsystem turns on, and that will be done through computer simulation. And now I'll hand it off to Noah Al-Hussein to talk about the physical docking subsystem. Initiate the docking sequence, which falls under the alignment verification sensors, 
and the blocking mechanism. As well, it should initiate the undocking sequence, which falls under the locking mechanism. Our threshold requirements are as, as follows, that our docking system is to be automated when docking, and it should enable, it should enable pay, uh, payloads to be obtained. As well, we need to reduce the uh, initial alignment error when docking, and we should also facilitate proper connection of subsystems between the bus and the payload. We have one objective requirement in which the physical docking subsystem needs to enable payloads to be exchanged, propellant to be exchanged. Uh, for the governing equations, we have the clearance calculation where we subtract the, the female radius, the small end radius minus the male the radius. Our second governing equation is to find the x and y components of an incoming force. For the physical docking subsystem design, we have three, um, three, three major components. Uh, the first one is the docking configuration, which we chose to be the probing rod. The second of all, we have the alignment verification sensor, which we chose to be the push button sensor. And third, we have the locking mechanism, and we chose that to be the uh, locking fence. Assumptions that were made is for the payload to approach in 2D, and the, the payload approaches in one orientation, as well as a, uh, as well as stationary bus. For the docking configuration, we expect the male element to fit inside the female element. And the second expectation is to connect with the initial error of talent, uh, and more specifically, a seven degree angle uh, error uh, from the GMC, as well as uh, 1.5 centimeters distance offset from the GMC. For the docking configuration, we chose the phone group as our docking configuration. Uh, it is able to transfer power, data, and propellant between the bus and the payload. It consists of two elements, the active, uh, the, uh, the, the active probe or the rod, or the passive cone. This is a non rider docking system, meaning that it's fixed for the active, for the male element to act as the active element, as well as it's fixed for the female element to act as the passive element. It enables payloads to be exchanged, also as well, it, it, it is able to tolerate mis uh, misalignments, as long as the probe is able to hit inside the cone. For our design drivers, we need enough space in the male element to uh, have enough space for the other subsystem components to fit inside of it. Also considering the initial offset tallness, we decided to choose the, uh, instead of a probe, a PVC reflector, where we have the outer diameter containing the other subsystem components, and inside the in, um, small in diameter where, uh, uh, the con where the connections are. Also, we chose the material to be full vinyl chloride, uh, based to reduce the need for fabrication as recommended from the structure subsystem. As shown here, we have the female element drawing. We can see that we have a 5.72 small end radius and a, an 11.18 centimeter uh, large end radius. Same thing follows with the uh, male element drawing. We have a 5.68 small end radius and a 10.98 large end radius. In a summary, we have the two a small end uh, radius, uh, which results in a full of 0.04 centimeters. Same thing with the large end radius, we have a 0.2 centimeters full uh, Looking at the requirement regarding male element fitting inside the female element, that is met. Second of all, we have the forces of docking. We have a taper wall angle from one side of the female element uh, with an angle of 45 degrees, also assuming the 7 degrees initial offset, that uh, that sums up to a total of 52 degrees. And we can decompose this incoming force into a Y component and the, um, an X component. As you can see here, we have a Y component of 0 0.78 times the incoming force, as well as an, an X component of 0 0.615 times the incoming force. We can conclude that the Y component is larger than the X component. Therefore, the, the incoming force should fly toward the Y component rather than the X component. Therefore, the requirement regarding connecting with the initial offset is met. Handing it to the aligned verification sensors to resolve. Thank you, Noah. <coughs> Next, we'll have, we'll have the aligned verification sensors. The drivers behind the design of these sensors can be summed as following. We needed a way to verify that the payload can duck with the bus within one and only one allowed orientation. We also needed to read or know the status
status of the document ports, meaning are they available or, uh, or occupied at a certain moment. And finally, based on that status, we need to initiate some action. For instance, once the docking occurred, we need to initiate an autonomous locking sequence. So accomplishing these goals can be done using alignment verification sensors. Our trade study showed that the push button sensor will be the best uh, option, uh, mainly because they are inexpensive, which plays an important role in this project due to the budget limitation. And they are, they are simple to implement from an electrical point of view. And most importantly, they can be distributed along the bus side in a sequence that will ensure that only within that sequence, all of the push buttons will be pressed. In order to make that happen, the same sequence will be uh, implemented along the payload side to, uh, uh, to implement pins. The uh, objective of these pins would be to press all of the push button sensor, which will confirm that the docking has occurred within the correct orientation. Finally, the sensors have a low power consumption and they can be tested and verified here in campus. So, uh, going forward with this design will satisfy the automated locking sequence requirement. For the locking mechanism, the driver behind this design can be summed as following. We uh, needed the bus to be able to dock and then dock, and we needed the payload to be locked during the mission period. In order to uh, satisfy these requirements, our trade study showed that locking pins will be the best option to go with. Uh, we'll have a total, as mentioned before, we'll have a total number of two locking pins which will be actuated uh, using linear actuator. The linear actuator will provide the locking force, which will, which will be decomposed into the horizontal and the downward or the uh, compressive force. So uh, if, we, if we apply a uh, 100 Newton of force from the linear actuator, this force will be decomposed into 50 Newton and 87 downward force. This downward force has uh, based on our calculation, we needed this amount, and this is a little bit extra for safety. Uh, this is with the safety margin. We needed this down for basically to lock the payload and for the uh, requirement of the uh, transfer uh, for transferring propellant. Uh, going with the uh, linear actuator trade study, we decided to go with the two inches with the nation linear actuator. Um, as you can see in the plot, we need, uh, as we mentioned before, we need 100 uh, Newton of load. And based on the linear relationship between the current and the payload, we'll, we'll ask the, the, the power subsystem to provide us with an amount of 0 0.75 current. Controlling this uh, locking will be, uh, will be done using a people born black. This is another board that will be implemented on, onto the uh, bus side. This is different than the one that the GNC will be using on the payload side. And we'll be con uh, controlling the, uh, the reverse and forward direction of the, uh, of the motor using the H bridge. For the internal, and for the uh, duration and the internal architecture as shown in this diagram, starting with the sensor, once the sensor has been triggered from the payload, they will send the confirmation signal to the microprocessor which will interpret that and will, send, will be communicating and controlling the linear actuator to lock the payload. Uh, at the same time, the microprocessor, which is the bigger one, will be exchanging data with, with the comp subsection, and the, both the microprocessor and our linear actuators will be powered via the power subsystem. As far as our current requirement status, we can see that we have pretty much make all of our requirements except the uh, three transfer requirements, i.e. power, data, and propellant transfer. Although our design and calculations show that we can meet the, these requirements, we can't actually verify it until we get into the real testing. So we'll be a no for now. As far as issues and recommendations, Based on the available commercial, uh, the commercially available product, we could say that the push button sensor will satisfy the physical document system requirements. However, we needed further testing for the probe and drop configuration to find the coefficient of prostitution, and another testing will be conducted onto the lock mechanism 
to find the best materials for the lacking pin as, uh, as well as the, the pin to put to the linear actuators configuration and a little bit of coding for the legal board. Next we'll have the structural and properly designed subsystem to simulate board bar. Hi, my name is Lauren Barr. I'm the team lead for the instruction uh, transfer subsystem, and my team mem member is Brendan Norris. Uh, so a brief outline of what we'll be going over. We'll start with an introduction of our subsystem, uh, our subsystem requirements, and our materials trade study. Then we'll go into our design and design analyses, and we will uh, discuss our integration with other subsystems, our requirements verification summary, and finish it up with our uh, issues and recommendations. So the structures uh, and uh, the column transfer subsystem is mainly responsible for uh, determining the primary materials for our entire structure, as well as housing all other components and subsystems. Uh, in, in addition, we are also responsible for facilitating the column transfer between the uh, probe and the probe sides of our uh, docking system. We are making the assumption that uh, we are excluding thermal control as it is outside of our scale. For our structural requirements, we include threshold requirements of housing all other components and subsystems. We include a uh, requirement that we shall have no more than three millimeters of deflection in the lateral direction due to a five newton force applied in the lateral direction. This is essentially to say that we will maintain rigidity in the lateral direction, but we do not foresee uh, high forces in the lateral direction. Uh, we also have the requirement of 250 Newton, withstanding 250 Newtons of longitudinal docking impact force. This number was determined using estimated masses of uh, bus and payload satellites and uh, typical docking speeds uh, for missions with the International Space Station. And we have the objective requirement of withstanding 500 Newtons. For our propellant requirements, uh, we have that the Propellant seal should maintain a maximum pressure, or should be within a maximum pressure of 200 kilopascals, and uh, be more than a minimum pressure of 82 kilopascals. And we shall transfer propellant at a minimum of 5 grams per second, with an objective threshold of 15 grams per second. So for our materials trace study, we determined that uh, the primary material for our structure uh, should be, uh, will be uh, polyvinyl chloride or PVC. We chose this material for its low cost at 150 uh, per kilogram. Uh, it, is, it has an excellent ease of machining, um, that we are able to uh, machine all of the uh, uh, holes and the other um, mounting apparatuses that we need for other components and subsystems. And uh, it has the Young's modulus of approximately 4.1 GPa gigapascals, uh, which is which allows it to be within our structural requirements. Looking at our design, we have uh, our uh, probe uh, components of our subsystem and drug component of the subsystem. Uh, looking at the probe component, we see that we allow a uh, design area for both the uh, propellant transfer uh, uh, locations and five uh, alignment verification sensors for the physical docking system, as well as in the center allowing uh, power transfer and a uh, eight pin uh, data connection for uh, data transfer for communications. Uh, looking at the drug side, we have the uh, receiving end for the five uh, alignment verification centers for sensors for physical docking system. And we have our receiving uh, components for the uh, propellant connector mounts, as well as uh, receiving uh, ends of the power connections. And on the inside, we have our uh, inlet for our A-pin data connection uh, bus. Now, I'll pass it off to Brendan to talk about our design analysis. OK, so to uh, verify our requirements, using a simulation in ANSYS uh, final element analysis software. We have taken the uh, 250, 250 Newton uh, threshold force 
and apply them as a distributed load across the bottom of the probe to simulate an uh, impact force with the bottom plate of the drogue. Um, the displacement constraints of all degrees of freedom are around the outside room where the connector or where the mounting bracket for the probe will be. And to, uh, to simulate our lateral deflection of five newtons and less than three millimeters of lateral deflection, uh, we have applied a pressure to the side of the probe while it's docked with the drogue and the, all um, the displacement constraints are the same. So as you can see, the compressive stress and the tensile stress for both 250 newtons, our threshold requirement, and 500 newtons, uh, our objective requirement of impact force, are several orders of magnitude less than the compressive strength of PVC and the tensile strength of PVC. As well as the lateral deflection, our required three millimeters, we have several orders of magnitude less maximum deflection for the five la newton lateral, um, lateral force. The same analysis was performed for the drogue side. Uh, the pressure was applied on the inside of the drogue to simulate the probe connector plate hitting the uh, drogue connector plate, as shown by this building here. Um, the displacement constraints are also around the outside rim of the drogue to simulate the drogue mounting bracket. The 5 newton lateral deflection pressure was also placed on the inside of the drogue wall to simulate um, 5 newtons lateral uh, deflection from the, from the probe uh, while locked. And again, the compressive stress and the tensile stress are both several orders of magnitude less than the compressive and tensile strength of PVC, as well as the lateral deflection is several orders of magnitude less than our required 3 millimeters of rigidity. So if the probe hits off center from the drogue uh, with our allotted 5% accuracy and hits this conical wall segment, we've uh, also put a 250 newton offset impact pressure on, on the wall and the displacement constraints are the same. For the deflection, um, the displacement constraints all are the same and the flight pressure is the same. And for this, the compressive stress is very much negligible. However, the tensile strength is more of a concern. However, it's, um, again, several orders of magnitude less than the tensile strength of PVC. And the deflection all also is still within our requirements, but it's uh, quite a bit more than the 250 perfect impact force. Okay, for the propellant design analysis, uh, we've gone with this setup with a pump, a quarrying pump, and a bucket that will transfer our uh, simulated propellant water uh, through the probe side of the docking system, through the drogue connector, uh, into a simulated storage, pre uh, pressurized storage tank using hydrostatic pressure to simulate a pressurized vessel. Uh, we're going with the model 1200 um, lifeguard aquatics uh, aquarium pump. and. Um, we have a maximum allotted rise out of the bucket of 2.8 meters of head, of head um, while still, uh, still maintaining our 5 grams per second mass flow rate. Uh, our achievable, well, the, when the tank is completely empty and the pressurized vessel is full, is 305 grams per second, well above our, both our threshold requirement and our objective requirement of 5 and 15 grams per second, respectively. And now I hand it back to Lauren for integration and requirement verification. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, so for integration, uh, you can see that our probe structure will be integrated mechanically with the communications power and GNC subsystems. And our drogue uh, component of our structure will be integrated mechanically with the communications power and physical docking system. Uh, as you can see here, we have met all of our requirements, including housing all components, our lateral deflection uh, withstanding longitudinal impact force and our propellant uh, flow requirements including max and minimum pressure and uh, flow rate. So moving forward, issues and recommendations. Uh, our uh, drogue design is a complex conical shape uh, that we would not be able to get a pre-fabricated uh, PVC part for. Uh, so that would require a custom part to be made. So moving forward, uh, we would look into uh, 
finding a cheaper option for producing that part, either finding a new material that might be easier for us to manufacture, or finding a uh, third party uh, company that might be able to uh, produce that part for us at a uh, low rate. And in addition, uh, we have shown through our analysis that our propellant pump will meet our specifications, but once we receive that pump, uh, we need to conduct testing to ensure that it meets our specifications. Now I'll be handing it off to uh, Alex Collins to uh, conclude our presentation. Thank you, Laura. Uh, again, I'm Assistant Project Manager Alexander Collins. Project Manager Delbert Khan will be presenting our conclusion and recommendations. So this is our request summary of system level requirements. As you can see, we have met all of our requirements except for the delivery date, which we are obviously unable to verify until we've actually completed the project in A4.5, as well as the accuracy of the GNC subteam. However, given further optimization from that team, we expect to be able to meet this requirement in the near future. As far as mission progression goes, all major components for subsystems and critical functions have been selected. So we've been able to get a good cost budget going. We have finished designing our test bed, the moving platform with ducted fan propulsion. We've completed proof of concept calculations and analysis for all critical functions. And it is our recommendation at this point that we proceed with the project based on this and our requirement status. As far as future work goes, we will need to calculate the necessary fan thrust and power draw in order to move the payload around effectively and at the correct speed. We will need to calculate the exact latching pin force and displacement needed necessary to make that secure connection without causing any damage to the payload. We'll need to optimize the attitude and translational accuracy of the GNC subsystem, as mentioned before, and we will obviously need to construct the system physically. Now I'd like to hand it back over to Mr. Delbert Khan to talk about our programmatics. Thank you, Alex. So to finish up, you can see a graph of our team's hours over here on the right. The blue line represents our actual hours, while the green and red are projected hours, the green being a linear projection, while the red being an actual projection. Um, from this, you can see a nice little dip right around here as we went into spring break, although we picked back up after that. Um, our team so far has been meeting all of our deadlines. We have no reason to believe that our, the difference between the projected hours and our actual hours is any cause for concern. Moving forward, we're going to be losing Ethan Higgins, as he's going to be going on an internship. But in turn, we're going to be gaining Benjamin Eastman. And so we expect to be able to continue to work successfully with other nations. So lessons that we've learned so far by going through this project, it's really important to set early deadlines. We like to turn in drafts so we can get feedback on all the documents that we've been turning in. It's formats are so hard to work with. Once you get a format, the team just wants to fill out that format. They don't want to include information that's outside of that scope. And it's the importance of clarity for first time readers. That's one of the ones that's really killed us is you need to be able to make the system understood by people that haven't seen the system before. And that's one of the things we still struggle with. And I think my team will agree with me on the one that's not up here, is it's a lot harder to present in front of all of you instead of just in front of them. <laughs> so for acknowledgments, we'd like to thank Dr. Gary Yale and Professor Richard Mangum for their continued support with the project and directing us as we go forward through it. And then all of the professors that have helped us, especially Mr. Jim Weber, Professor Kodemeyer, Bruder, Fabian, Benavides, Wall, Sensmeyer, Post, Hill, Gentilini, Davis, Seward, Eisenberg, and Professor Morris. They've been influential in getting this project started and just giving us information about what we need to do and really help on anything we come to them for. Finally, of course, we'd like to thank our panelists and ask you for any questions that you have. Thank you for your time.
I'm going to, I know the panel still have lots of questions that focus on other areas, so I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to stick to the area that I know, which is going to be the, mechan the mechanical subsystems and I guess some of the GDC. And I'll try to keep my, sh my questions short since this is a pretty large panel. So first for the GNC folks. Um, there was an issue with the NAV software where as you got closer in range, your errors actually grew. And I didn't quite understand why. Do you, do you have an explanation for that? I don't, but Drew, uh, Jonathan Travis. Jonathan knows this. Yeah. Jonathan Travis can answer that question more thoroughly than I can. Jonathan? I believe the error came from when we were doing the calculation uh, with the webcam that we were using, we didn't have the actual focal length that uh, we had to calculate that focal length. And uh, more testing would need to be done to get more accurate results, but I believe the error comes from the inaccuracy in focal length. Okay. And possibly the targeting that you had to use in terms of your shape and so forth. Yes. Bring up slide number 81, please. So this is for the actual uh, physical clocking mechanisms, folks. So with the, uh, the Russian probe cone system is shown there above, the latching mechanism is actually on the probe head of the grapple shaft. So that the, I guess the passive, the passive side is so my question to this group is, why did you decide to put the latching on the active as opposed to the, I'm sorry, the passive so as opposed to the active side? Oh, thank you for your question. No, I apologize, I didn't actually say here now. That's um, so we actually toyed with that idea, and what we came up with was the idea is to make um, the possibility of launching payloads cheaper. Okay. Now, if we had everybody, you know, um, needing to design a system, um, a locking mechanism, you know, and add it to their payload, it adds to their cost. As opposed to, okay, we tell them, these are the specifications, just make the slots, and then set it up, we'll take care of it. Well, likewise, you could, you could have on your main bus, or your, your passive vehicle, you can have slots, and the only cost to the payload folks would just be maybe uh, just a spring activated latch that would fit the slots in the payload system. So it's something to consider. I know that you've incorporated uh, quite a bit of design to actuate your latching mechanism. So it's just, it's just one of those trade-offs that you might want to consider. Um, friction. Big problem here and the reason that this design is done the way it is. The head of the probe is a spherical device has a very small uh, point of contact as it's sliding along the surface, so friction is reduced. How do you guys plan to accommodate that with your, your cone to cone? Right, um, with that, we that's why we work with structures to decide on PVC. Uh, PVC can be polished. I believe the uh, coefficient of friction from PVC to PVC is uh, 0 0.04. Okay, polishing um, Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Uh, that's good. Um, let me see. Just a couple more, and then I'll pass the mic on. Let's see. The push button sensors. Um, another problem with devices like this is they usually have a resistive uh, force because of the spring stiffness on the actual uh, on the sensors themselves. And in some cases, the sensors can push the devices apart. 
unless you have a way to keep it in soft contact or soft capture. So have, have you thought about what, have you tested or planned to test what, what your push button sensors are going to provide? Did you have five? Not just one or two. But and for that question, I'll pass it on to Vasad. So for the push button, basically we decided the, uh, based on the momentum of the approaching payload, it might actually crush the sensor. So uh, based on that momentum, we could add two uh, metal plates in order to reduce the amount of uh, force needed to actually press the button. So they will be held a little bit back. So not all of the force will be compressing the, the sensor. Okay, but the sensors themselves are spring-based, is that not? Yeah, yeah, mechanically, yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. So that's something else that you probably want to test. Uh, yeah, actually, we pretty much uh, ordered a little some uh, samples, and they are actually uh, different from the uh, force needed to, for them to be pressed. Okay. So that's actually a good point. Some of them need a lot of force to be pressed, even for a human being. So we uh, actually decided to, to go with some uh, push buttons that need a minimum amount of force. Thank you. Uh, just to elaborate on that, the ducted fans that we are obtaining to use on this project can generate considerably more force than necessary, and they will be able to, compre to compress those buttons while the latching pins engage. Okay. So then that requires coordination in terms of keeping your, all your alignments and everything uh, as, you're, as you're pushing those in. Absolutely, sir. Okay. And that will be a challenge going into the okay. So tolerances are very important, too, I guess. Um, one last question. Tendencies. What happens if one of your sensors fails? What do you, what do, you do in that case? So basically that was uh, one of the debates that we had uh, as a team. Uh, we could have uh, achieved the same goal using one sensor, but in case of what that sensor actually failed, it would be a mission fail since the docking cannot be verified for the uh, market control. So we decided that the minimum amount, the minimum acceptable amount would be three and we'll add in two for redundancy. Okay. That's basic. And we could actually change the number of the accept. We're using an M uh, gate logic. Mm -hmm. So basically, if all of them are being pressed, that's a true. And we could change that via uh, uh, changing the actual programming for the microcontrol. Okay. If one of them fails. That's good, that's good thinking, because uh, I was just curious how you're planning to handle that. I was, I was thinking in order for you to know your your orientation, then you do need two on one side, one on the other, yeah. and then on three, yeah. that you take care of the redundancy on that. So, uh, good job, everyone. You guys, you guys did a great job here. And uh, again, I, I, I'm anxious to hear how this will all <laughs> play out. Yeah, cool. Remember, test, verify, validate. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you, I'll, pass the, uh, I'll pass the mic on now. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, great job. Great job. Um, my name is Jody Davis. I'm at NASA Goddard and I work uh, hardware innovation and test the James Webb Space Telescope uh, out in the DC area. So first I wanna say, yeah, great job. I particularly liked your flow and arrangements of your presentations, how you all had the same outline. It was very clear and concise. I thought it was very easy to follow, which is extremely important when you're trying to look at all subsystems, all disciplines and assess everyone you know, the, the same way. Um, so I'll start with higher level questions first. I was curious with your, your cost, the $1,400 that you had to stay under, and your breakdown, I think with the ground system included, you were just under $1,000. So the $400, uh, was that margin, or do you feel like you could make some more expensive choices in terms of your equipment to optimize your design a little more? Because $400 is a good margin. I'm not advocating cost overrun by any means, but I was just curious. <laughs> about that. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, we do have a managerial reserve that we keep as $200. That's what we decided as a team we wanted to have. Uh, so that leaves us with $1,200. Uh, from that $820 that we have, we, as a team, we're all making trade studies on what type of products we wanted to use, and we factored cost in very heavily. Although I'd say the team didn't make any huge sacrifices in terms of what they were doing when they were using a cheaper alternative when they were considering cost. Because for some of the teams, like uh, I'll use type, type of team power for an example, the difference between using the automotive wire gauge power or wire system and the uh, photovoltaic wires was 
hundreds of dollars. So really we did cut back on costs, although we're not expecting that to be something where if we were to use more expensive parts, we'd be succeeding on more, I guess, or be able to do more with that product. That's good, thank you. Uh, the next one. Um, so for GNC, um, the angular accuracy concerned me a little bit. Um, you guys were not, you know, just not meeting your requirement, but you were off by quite a bit. Um, and then you mentioned, you mentioned your, one of the kind of path, path forward for that to try to, to resolve that within the, under the seven degrees, um, improvements in MATLAB code. And like Les mentioned, you know, testing and verification of software is so important, so important, and we need ample time for that. Um, but can you give a little more details on what sort of improvements you make to the code? Again, I will pass this off to Jonathan to explain. So this, <coughs> well, initially with the uh, the code, it would just find the circle, uh, but with different ranges, we need to change the, the focus of the camera. And the camera I was using was very limited, and so I didn't, uh, when we were testing that in, change the, uh, the parameters of the focus. So focusing would improve the finding the circle as the edge would be more sharp. And the new target, uh, as we displayed in the presentation, would require new code because instead of finding a circle as a symbol, like the center of gravity, uh, they use using crash test dummies. The code would require us to find the corners of the circle, so the co color contrast from white to black, and that would allow us to actually measure the distance instead of just using a bunch of geometry in the circles. Good, thank you. And then uh, for structures, um, I know you, you said you conducted your trade study for the material that you chose. You ended up with PVC, but do you have a little more detail on other materials that you consider? I know PVC is super cheap and, and easy to machine, but did you consider, what else did you consider? Uh, yeah, so we actually uh, considered a wide variety of materials, including um, a bit, uh, materials that would be easily available to us on campus, such as aluminum, uh, stainless steel, and, um, Polymer and uh, carbon fiber matrices, but uh, looking at those uh, results, and we also include, included uh, magnesium alloys and beryllium alloys, uh, just for uh, to be thorough. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the database team mirrors are made out of beryllium. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we found that uh, because we're not designing a straight system, and uh, we don't. Uh, need to worry about uh, how it's temperature right <laughs> uh, we're, and thermal, thermal controls also outside of our subs uh, scope um, that we could get away with using PVC um, so because it's good enough uh, it was uh, a viable material for us great thank you so last question is um, more of a kind of a team communication uh, aspect so sometimes you find an industry that, that Different disciplines don't necessarily talk to each other very well. They're kind of stovepiped, and what happens with that is that um, it's, it's very hard to close the design. You can have a miscommunication that happens that, that results in something detrimental on a project. So I was wondering how you guys felt, maybe I'm looking at the project managers here. How do you feel the teams communicated with each other, the discipline teams communicated with each other? Uh, I think I can answer that pretty well. Um, one of the great things our university does is they really have a strong focus on systems engineering. And so Dr. Yao, Professor, or I don't know what I'm saying, Professor, Dr. Ben Lidas, they really focus on systems engineering and we incorporate that when we start our project. You start from the systems level and you break it down by subsystem. And all of our teams, they select what subsystem they want to work on. They said that's something they enjoy working on. And so really the communication flow is all going through systems. We have all of that integration and we just verify everything, we're always working together. I'd say we spend most of our time working as a group as opposed to working on individuals, although there is those projects that are individual based, and then they come back and we're sharing all the information. That's great, excellent. My last comment, I, I know this, the way that you guys are dressed, I know it's very creative, because that also adds to the flow, but that's actually really important, the visual aspect, and so I, I really like the coordination between each discipline with your entire <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the one thing you don't see is all of us have the same pocket protectors, so some of us don't have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Including, of course, Dr. Eno. <laughs> So my name is Scott Liu, and I'm a um, retired military, uh, now a consultant, and I've spent my whole career working in military space programs from the program management side. <coughs> so um, my comments are going to be more at a higher level, more of a management level, not as a detail in my level that uh, the total panel is here today to do. Um, but in general, I want to ask a question about the PDC. Again, you mentioned that you're not able to machine a PDC, and so that's going to be something that you're going to have to change. Um, I know that you already talked about it once, but all these other materials that you talked about, have you actually come up with what your alternative is going to be? Because that affects, obviously, everything that you've done with respect to the docking mechanisms and friction and all of that. Um, have you actually decided or come up with how you're going to um, manufacture the docking mechanism? So currently we have the estimate as $100 is getting it custom made, although we're going to be going forward with that as our estimate and seeing what the company that will be producing it will charge us for. Assuming it's within our budget, we'd be going with that, so we wouldn't have the issues you're referring to. Okay. If it's without, if it's not inside of our budget, we have been discussing all alternatives to it. Right now, I think the most popular one would be the wet mold carbon fiber, and then use that as our substitute. Although I'd have to pass it off to structures to see if they have something different to say about that. Uh, yeah. So for our probe structure, um, we're actually using a uh, eight to four inch reducer uh, that's already commercially available for um, the PVC aspect of that structure. Um, so that's available, and so the problem comes in with the drug. And as Delbert said, uh, we would be um, uh, we, we already have an estimate of $100 for uh, that custom part, um, and that could change as we go on. And depending on our uh, budget constraints, with I think that might come up with other sub teams, uh, then we would look into um, other alternatives uh, for different materials that we could use. Um, other than that, um, what I want to comment more on was the overall presentation of the team, uh, the, the uh, layout of the briefing, the presentation of the briefing, and um, one of the things that, that strikes me when I come in and I've been here for several meetings is um, really the professionalism with, with which you guys present your, your overall design reviews. Um, I've been to, as, as these folks here have been to, multiple design reviews from contractors that spend millions of dollars to put these together. And I can tell you, I think your presentation is equally as good as any of those. So you've done a really good job to structure your briefing. You've laid out the requirements. You've laid out how you're going to you approach satisfying those requirements. Um, you have um, obviously practiced your speech uh, quite a bit. The you know, presentation of the group as a team very professional looking and all of those things are uh, important things when you actually get into a presentation where you're presenting the design for a multi-million or billion dollar system. Thank you. So from that perspective, uh, I think you guys have done an outstanding job. Uh, hello, my name is Jim Bowler. Uh, I've got three years experience in aerospace engineering. Um, I just want to start off by saying very good job. I'm very impressed with the detail you have put in this project. Um, I've got one engineering question and the rest of it's probably just more nitpicky than anything. We're just some good lessons on type stuff. Uh, the question I have is on slide 91. The locking Can you please explain this diagram a little bit better because I'm very skeptical of the arrangement of these I'm going to pass that off to Alex, or should I pass that off to PDS? 
Uh, thank you, sir. Um, so with these numbers, there has been some debate among the team about how this calculation was supposed to be done. Um, so this is us breaking down the for the 100 newly incoming force from the actuator into its x and y components using simple trigonometry based on the 30 degree angle of the latching pin head. Um, I guess a, a little more clarification on exactly what you so you're applying about. this load to a very shallow angle, and your result is that the majority of your force is distributed normal to your incoming force. That's yes. where I've got some skepticism on this. So you believe that the force downward should be greater? Well, you're showing here that the force downward is greater. I don't think that's going to be the case. Okay. I, I can believe that your force downward would be close to 50. I don't think it's going to be. 87% of your, of your load, just based on that angle. Um, so that, that's just something I would recommend uh, re-exploring to understand a little bit better. Absolutely. Um, the other comments I had were, I'd love to see that you guys have outlined your requirements. That, that is a really important process of any, putting together any proposal. Uh, I do sense that there is some confusion, though, in the understanding between what constitutes a threshold versus what constitutes an objective. I'm glad to see that you guys put that distinction in there, and that is very important. But um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, requirements in the threshold that I would recommend labeled as objective. They, the difference between the two really is your objective is your plan A. It's what you want to do. It's what you've been requested to do. Your threshold is more of your plan B. And the joke is always, you know, close enough for government work. <laughs> <laughs> There are some areas where you have basically go, no go criterion, and I can understand the confusion that's coming from that, but when your options are one or zero, that's not going to be as much of a threshold as it is an objective. Uh, the threshold is basically your wiggle room to say, hey, I didn't meet what you asked, but we were so close, you still need to keep us in the future. Uh, just something to keep in mind in the future. Um, other than that, I really didn't have any comments, but yeah, just the understanding of the requirements and this diagram. Great job. Thank you. All right, uh, my name is Ashley Allman. I work down in Houston at Ocean Air and Space Systems on the, the One EVA contract with NASA, uh, currently designing and assisting the EVA program. Um, recent graduate, 2013. So I had a couple of comments. Let's see. Let me go back to. You guys did a great job, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> so first, on your uh, pneumatic fittings for the uh, propellant transfer, I have a, a question. You guys threw that into some really early slides and never mentioned again the actual fittings. Uh, did you guys take into account the force to make those fittings into your you did? Okay. <laughs> um, I also want to stress uh, testing, testing at the component level as early as possible. And um, touching back on the budget just a little bit, um, the extra budget I think is a good thing because you're going to run into issues. <laughs> you're always going to, you're going to find issues with certain components perhaps we need that don't meet the requirements like you thought they would. Um, Traditionally, and we learned a lot of lessons ourselves with this, but you'll find that some of your components, uh, when you go on the cheaper end, are have really wide tolerances, which are hard to incorporate and make work in your design, um, your detailed design. So keep that in mind. Um, do as much component level testing as you can to make sure that those will work, um, especially with your fans. You can use it for for um, potential issues coming with that. Uh, I didn't, a lot of my more technical questions have already been asked and answered. Uh, one thing that I would have really liked to see is your criteria matrix for your trade studies to kind of see what options you can do with. Uh, we actually have those in our backup slides. We left them out of the presentation in terms of time. We, told, okay. we were told we were limited to an hour, and we actually did that pretty much perfectly. Thank you, Dr. Young. If you want us to pull them up, though, I'm sure all of us are more than happy to. <laughs> 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 Yeah, just looking at that. Yeah, we didn't have any backup slides, so we didn't have any. Oh, okay. I'll look at that. I have to pack it. One of our, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So this is one of our sample matrices. This is the one we use when choosing the navigation software. So the MATLAB, C, all the other programming languages. And if we were presenting on those, we would go through how we describe our percentage bases and how we allocate for them. Well, that's good. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that you guys put a lot of work into that and probably want, want that to be easy. Okay. Um, really good job. And yeah, I think the rest of things are just a little bit different. So you guys did a really great job. Hello, my name is Dr. Oleg Cindy. I graduated the same year as Julio from Riddle, so I was only up where you are 11 and a half years ago. Uh, just the mayor of the and I. I work at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I work on anything from CubeSats to space station instruments, to deep space robotic missions, to human spaceflight vehicles. So, and when you guys start talking about the docking, I was thinking docking is really hard. And I also was thinking, uh, as far as things that right now, are really hard for the industry. That is one of the major challenges, and we're seeing more and more space vehicles uh, wanting to dock to do resupply missions, refueling. So I was actually even reminded of a quote uh, from JFK where he said, "We do these things because they are hard." So I was inspired. But you guys should know to do what's hard. And so because rocket science is hard. So that's my so cool project. That's what I'm trying to say. I do have some um, comments on uh, slide 15. I was honestly uh, quite a bit concerned about the statement um, from two perspectives. Uh, it wasn't clear when we presented the budget which parts had been procured and which parts were under procurement. And that's usually a major, even if the cost is good, sometimes getting what you need can be, uh, uh, it can be six weeks or it can be a year long endeavor. So with Highland Care, you guys actually have the opportunity for the summer to potentially procure some of these parts if you haven't already. So I know you guys are heading out, but next week, there's things that you can throw orders in if you decided that this is what we're gonna go with, definitely do it, do it now. Uh, trust me, it will help you to schedule quite a bit come uh, fall. Um, and I didn't see a schedule, so I can't, from your statement here that you're expecting to meet the December next schedule, I have no verifiable evidence, so I don't think I have backup slides on that. But, you know, I wanna see, the, I would wanna see the procurement schedule, the development schedule, the integration and testing schedule, and see your margins if I was, Honestly, saying that yes, you can do this. So it's something for you to consider um, when you come back in the fall and you're putting these together. You know, that's probably one of the first things that we can expect a project manager. Okay. Yeah, that is one of the things we haven't done actually is uh, create a Gantt schedule for all the different sub teams. Although that is a great suggestion, and we will really be taking that into account. Okay. And then as part of that, also, I would highly encourage you. You guys have some margin on the cost. To think about spares. Uh, the big, the biggest one that I could think of right away is for your payload, the battery. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of tests in IT, and IT is going to be pushed. It's going to be coming, and so having a second battery that's fully charged, ready to go, with, uh, if cost allows, I would definitely recommend procuring that. Um, and then, of course, take a look at your other risks and see what other spares might come in handy or available. Uh, being here with our cell side, we on our detailed design project, uh, we had one critical test equipment, a load cell, and we burnt it out in our first test, and then we could not verify our thrust because we no longer had. So, um, and it wasn't necessarily expensive part, but it was a six week procurement cycle. So when you burn it out a week prior to your confirmation, we were done for. So, think spares, because they will come in handy for sure. Um, how many, do you have any members on your team that are software or electrical engineer or computer science? Uh, EDs, would you like to raise your hand? Okay. <laughs> so that's that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> I saw so much of where you need help, and uh, so that's great. And um, definitely will come in. Really handy. I uh, have to hear that. Um, I want to talk about the propellant interface next. Uh, the biggest thing that I noticed about that was like safety, safety, safety screen to me. Because typically, and especially in docking mechanisms, you do not put any power connector next to a propellant connector. That's just, and I understand the constraints of the project and the environment you work in. But I'm really concerned, and I want you guys to talk about this about the. Um, how will you ensure that the connector is solid and tight before you start pouring uh, water and so that it doesn't close a potential electric fusion shock and potentially so that your fusion shock to you guys but also uh, short out your hardware uh, because they are so close. I think I can pass this off to Alex to talk about it better than I can. Thank you, Dick. Um, so as you can see from this diagram, we first of all, we've arranged our propellant connections to be 
Here, well, not that far away from our power transfer connections, to be honest, but the first step when we're testing is going to be to verify that we can get leak-free flow through those propellant connections before the power connections are even inserted into the assembly. Uh, they will be secured, and if there is any leak, we will secure them with Teflon tape and take whatever other measures are necessary to make sure that there is no leak in it. Um, also, at the beginning of the power section, I believe they mentioned that there was a uh, short circuit protection, 150% current flow. So if there is any water causing problems with the current, we will be able to detect that immediately, and that will trigger an immediate cutoff of the power system to prevent any electrocution hazards. Okay. I, did, but, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, we also have five alignment verification sensors, and another purpose of those is that uh, uh, power data and uh, propellant transfer does not begin until after all five uh, verification sensors uh, return a uh, true value. Yeah. I would encourage you, especially during testing, when it's two o'clock in the morning, you stick to that. If you don't meet your safety criteria, you stick to it and you take a pause, you walk away, you try to test whatever you need to do, but that, so, because really that's a huge safety concern right there. So, so it's cool, but I'm just seeing, you know, if there's a water coming down right onto that power connector, bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, safety first. And then, uh, let's see. Overall, I, uh, I have some other comments here, but I really do think that this is a really cool project and that you guys have a really good leg up on the detailed design uh, of Roman Um And I would say, if you did need to bestow something, because when it comes to that, they have uh, the propellant uh, that has like, there, just because uh, I think the power of the data are more than enough for our 60, 50 week course. So uh, that's something to consider as well. I know that every project, when you get detailed, start looking at the schedule, the budget, and the resources. And so I just think that that might what be one area that you guys could potentially instill that you could fix. Yeah, I know I did run through it pretty quickly, but propeller transfer is one of our secondary uh, our objectives. It's not one of our threshold uh, requirements. It's objective requirement, it's something we'd like to be able to do, although it is difficult, Scott brought this up, and I really did run through it pretty quickly, so we do consider it. Cool, good job. Good um, uh, also regarding uh, the propulsion system, or the propellant, sorry, um, how do you verify that those connections are actually made since it's, it's inside the cone and you can't actually see the connections? I guess I can answer that, or Patrick can answer that. The alignment, the way we have our alignment set up for our push button sensors doesn't allow for any errors, for although we also have our locking pins that will be locking it in in a specific orientation because we don't have any translation in the C direction. Okay, but if you're not pushed in all the way and you haven't made those connections, are you, are you positioning the sensor such like far enough in that you make that connection before you? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then also for your pump. Is your pump, is there a sensor that tells you, uh, I mean, is the pump automated or are you guys turning the pump on to initiate the long transfer? The pump is automated, although I'm going to pass it off to Alex Collins to speak more about that. Thank you. Um, so uh, this goes a little bit back to what you were saying about safety concerns. So during testing, the pump will not be automated because we want to verify that, you know, those connections are secure manually before we actually activate the pump. So it'll be manual in the beginning, and then yes, it is operating successfully. It will transfer into an automatic process. Okay. That was awesome. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. Right, I think we're going to have to get out of here so the next team can uh, uh, get ready. We'll uh, start again at 10 10:15. 10, but I want to thank the panel in particular and.